Hey there, welcome to Closet Cases. I'm your host, Sean Hollenbach, and this is a show where LGBTQ comedians and performers tell their coming out and transitioning stories, normally live on stage, but now we're doing it in our homes. Uh, we're doing it because we're part of the Social Distancing Festival, so I want to thank Nick Green so much for allowing us to be part of that, so thank you for this uh, event. And normally we do this show at the Stonewall Inn, which is the birthplace of LGBTQ rights, and uh, the staff that's normally there, they're not working tonight because obviously we're closed. Um, so Lawrence, Charles, and Kimley, I love you guys so much. Uh, guys, I'm putting their Venmos up right now. So if you want to help support them in their time of need. And I also want to thank all of our first responders, our friends who are working in restaurants, our friends who are working in grocery stores, the police, just everyone who's out there on the front lines of this. I just want to thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so let's get into our stories. I came out in 1997. I lost my virginity to Joel Longenecker the night that Ellen DeGeneres came out on television. And I was one of those gays that I call a TikTok gay that basically everyone's like, when's Sean coming out? TikTok, TikTok. Like basically nobody shed a tear at all. Like when I sat down with my mother, I was like, mom, I'm gay and I'm sort of crying. And she's like, uh, Sean, I kind of knew since you were in third grade. Your teacher, Mr. Gray, sat me down at her parent-teacher conference and said, artistic people are special people. Yeah, I was very special, very special. Um, so I'm gonna tell you the top 10 reasons I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet, but I'm gonna tell them to you throughout the night, uh, which is gonna be fun. So the top 10 reason I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet is that I watched Dirty Dancing seven times in one weekend Wishing I was Jennifer Grey. Yeah. I rewound that scene where Patrick Swayze got out of bed and you kind of see his butt like at least a hundred times. Uh, the number nine reason I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet is I my first music purchase was Tiffany. I think we're alone now. I certainly was. Guys, so I'm ready to bring on our first comic. She's amazing. She's done the show before. She's done our podcast, which is... R.I.P. Um, but you can listen to her down here if you want. Um, she's phenomenal. She was in the New York Comedy Festival and she's doing the show from her bed. So put your hands together for the amazing Jay McBride. Hey, what is up? This is Jay McBride and I am here for your social distancing closet cases and uh, feels a little weird. Still indoors. This is the first time putting on makeup. Quite honestly, I'm still in pajamas. All right. I'm wearing, I've dressed from like the waist up. So you then. There they, there they are. They're my pajamas. That, that's it. That, that's me. I'm sorry. That's the best thing I do. This is the first time I put on makeup in like a month. Um, yeah, if I don't come down with rickets, I'll be shocked. I don't even know what rickets is. Um, but anyway, thank you guys. I hope you're all doing well during this quarantine. Uh, I'm going to tell you my coming out story. It was a little different. It was a uh, long time ago. Over 13 years, over 13 years. How insane is that? Like back then, like now it's like, oh yeah, I came out and you know, it's, it's like my parents are like, what are your pronouns? You know, it, it's, I think they get it now, which is great. But back in the day, it was like, imagine a world where everyone was under quarantine if you were trans uh, and everyone was a Trump supporter. That's what it felt like. So when I came out as trans, uh, it was, it, it was like, ugh, it was tough. It was really tough. And I did it the, the bravest way possible, which is email. Um, you know, I, I didn't even want to risk face to face. Um, but, uh, it's, that's just what I did. I, I, I sent an email out. I typed this long email at like three in the, three in the morning or something like that saying like, Hey guys, this is, uh, what's new. How about those Mets? Um, uh, what's going on with that hair? Um, and saying like, Hey, by the way, here's what's happening. Uh, and then like I put out my feelings. I was talking about how, how like it's been such a long process. I'm in therapy. It's been terrible. I'm in suicidal, blah, 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 blah. So I typed this out. It was probably like three pages. It was, you know, and it was, it, it was a Yahoo email or something. Okay. It, it wasn't exactly, you know, it was back in the day. I was like Dorito fan or something, you know, I, I don't know. Um, so I typed this long email and I thought, here we go. I'm sending it to my brothers. Uh, and uh, we'll see how they react. I kind of talked to my mom a little bit before then, but it was, um, but anyway, so I have this email. I'm getting ready to send it out. I hit send. Finally, after like a half hour, I'm just like, 
just do it, just do it, just send it, send it, tell them, come out, come out. So I hit send uh, and immediately got back, error, there is no subject line. Do you want to send anyway? I'm like, Arr! so it was gr excruciating. And so, yes, I hit send again a second time. Um, and the support was okay. It was, it was all right. Three brothers, uh, two, perfectly fine. One, not a fan. Uh, in fact, he disowned me when he found out, which, but I have a great joke about it now. Uh, so at his expense, which I feel like is like, that's my victory. You know, that's my victory where, uh, the joke is, um, that my brother disowned me, but you know, I try and be the bigger person, you know, like when I heard he and his wife had a child, they sent him the nicest greeting card. It said, congratulations. It's a boy for now. Um, I literally made out those greeting cards just for that purpose, just for that joke. I, but it, it was good. He still hasn't spoken to me um, for the most part, other than nodding at each other at my mom's funeral, which was a little weird, you know, that, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Is that an, an Irish thing? You know, you get drunk and you just nod at people. I don't know. But that was my coming out story there. I also, coming out to work was another really difficult thing. I was a manager of a bookstore, which is like, you know, if you're going to come out anywhere, <laughs> make it a bookstore. Okay. It was, it was like LGBT Shangri-La. Um, you know, it, it was perfect for that. Uh, and everyone there was great. Um, I tried to actually talk to people in little batches that was, um, but that didn't work out. So eventually I typed out a whole letter handed it to them and had them read it in front of me. And if they had any questions, I don't know why this isn't how you're supposed to do it. I don't think, I don't know. Um, well now again, it, it's a little easier. It's not a lot easier, but it's still a little easier. Um, but yeah, at the time it was terrifying. You could, you could have parents who would send you to conversion therapy. Think it, I mean, like you could have parents who would send you to like, to a loony bin to have electroshock if you came out as gay. And, and I mean, like trans, forget it at the time. They didn't even know what trans was. Uh, so it was a difficult time. Got through it. And now um, I wouldn't say it's been an easy road necessarily. Uh, in fact, just the opposite. But it's definitely been rewarding. And I think what people people um, tend to get the wrong idea of what, about what coming out means. It's almost like I feel like some people look at it as me coming out means I'm going to be happy finally. And, and it's, it's, that's not the case, you know? It's just saying, this is me coming out, which means when I do live my life and I do face life's challenges, it's going to be as me and not as the person that people assume I'm supposed to be. So, um, and that's my wisdom. That's it. That's all I've gotten after 13 years. Uh, if you have someone who is having problems coming out, please please have them reach out to me. Or if you're someone who's having problems coming out, feel free to reach out to me. I'm sure anyone on this show would love to hear from you and give you some advice. Um, everyone has their own story. Uh, and, you know, you have to find the right way that's right for you. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um, yeah. My walk down pajama leaf. It's like a slumber party. Oh, my God. I never had one growing up. So, look, where's my, where's my stuffed animal? I got my stuffed whale, so we can, actually, it's creepy, I have the rest of the stuffed animals staring at me on the wall, like, like, they're audience members, it's so creepy, they're, they're, like, 80 of them, they're just looking at me, that's not true, I don't have any, there's nothing on the wall, see, it's nothing, it's nothing, all right, well, thank you very much, I'm Jay McBride, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of this show, and I will see you soon. Give it up for Jay McBride, amazing, I love her so much, oh my god. So, back to the top 10 reasons I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet. Uh, number seven, I was surprisingly good at musical theater. And here's proof. <laughs> Boy, that Sean Hollabach sure could dance. Boy, he's really light and loafers, isn't he? Show, true, show, true. Um, the number seven reason you should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet is that I shared a Tyco racetrack with my twin brother that I magically turned into a Dickensian Christmas village all year long. Yes, I was that gay. Okay, guys, are you ready for your next act? 
He's phenomenal. Uh, he's done the show a bunch of times before. Uh, I actually went to college with this guy and he's written in my trunk from Winchester, Virginia, all the way to Washington, DC. Put your hands together for the amazing Adolfo Blair. Hey everybody. Thank you, Sean Hollenbach, for having me, having me for this edition, this very special edition of Closet Cases. I hope everybody out there is surviving quarantine. Now, this is actually not my first time doing Closet Cases, and doing a few of them, I actually really, really enjoy kind of pinpointing so many of the folks sharing their stories, their eureka moment. Now the eureka moment is the moment when they realize, oh my God, I'm different. If they're a male, they might cisgendered male, they may say, oh, I'm gay. I did not have that moment. No, I was a big queen from the word go. <laughs> when I came out in the operating room, the whole room said, hey girl. <laughs> now, lest there be any question of just how queenie I was, let's go to the video. That's right, in this edition, there is actually video clips. This first clip, is, well, it's me at seven years old entering the talent show. All I'm gonna say is choreography and costuming by me. So obviously, not the butchest boy on the block. <laughs> now, you would think my parents would have recognized this, but they didn't. Now, let's, let's talk about the parents. My mom's name is Pixie. Let that settle in for a minute. Pixie. Um, Pixie is about five foot two. She's got big blonde hair dyed. Platinum blonde hair, blue eyes, big long eyelashes. She likes to do Mae West impersonations. She's got the face of a cherub angel, the mouth of a sailor, and she likes to wear leopard fur fuck me pumps. My dad, on the other hand, is the complete opposite. My father is, he is, well, I like to think of him as the three C's. Calm, collected, conservative. He is rather stoic. My friends have met him about a million times. They have no recollection of this. Um, and he, he's got a guy who reads the sports page every Saturday and Sunday. Oh, yeah. One of my favorite memories growing up is actually Saturday mornings. I would come downstairs to our basement to watch television. I would come down in this getup. It would be a white V-neck t-shirt, cinched in with a belt, uh, white tidy whities blue rain galoshes, which I thought showed off my legs, and a rope that I would wrap up and tie and tuck under the belt. I thought it was cute. Um, and over top of all of this, I would overdress it with my bathrobe, which to me was a Diane von Furstenberg wrap dress. And I would come downstairs and watch reruns of the 1970s fabulous, fabulous TV show, Wonder Woman, starring Linda Carter. And when Diane, Diana Prince would turn around and explode into Wonder Woman, I would turn around and explode into Wonder Woman ripping off my bathrobe. And then I would run around and around and around our coffee table, finally jumping off the side of the couch going, 
Meanwhile, Ernie is just reading the sports page. And by reading, I mean hiding behind. <laughs> now, lest there be any more question of just how queenie I was, again, let's go to the videotape. And in this case, this is what happens when you allow an 11 year old to play with a video camera in the basement. Yes. Hey, girl. Remember that? Hey, girl. <laughs> Madonna's Vogue. Yes. Performed by Fabulous Adolfo. So, <laughs> yeah. Now, for any of you parents out there, you might be going, oh my gosh, boy, this child was effeminate. I'm going to give you a few short, easy things to look for that if your child has any of these symptoms, they may be an effeminate male. These are true. Number one, if your son at age 10 asks to get a hairstyle so that he can look like the 1966 cover of Barbara Streisand's album of Je m'appelle Barbara, he may be an effeminate man. Two, if your child asks, male child, cisgender child, asks to ice skate because he watched the 1991 made-for-TV movie on Thin Ice, the Thai Babylonia story. He may be an effeminate child. Number three, if your cisgendered male child cannot ice skate, so instead takes up rollerblading in the style of Olympic figure skating and enters himself in the gymnastics tumbling show at school, doing one of these Olympic rollerblading type routines to a melodramatic, melodramatic Madonna song. Well, let's see the video. Hashtag living girl. Yes, living my best Johnny Weir dreams. So wouldn't you know that I would end up in the gayest activity in high school? Now you might notice at the end of that video, there was sort of a cute guy on the right side. His name was Justin Ross. Now Justin Ross was the captain of the wrestling team. And I should probably back it up. Okay, so second week of high school, I am walking down the hallway, minding my own business, humming to myself tunes from the movie On a Clear Day You Can See Forever. True story when all of a sudden, this guy walks up to me. What's up? So I said, nothing. Now I was like really into, uh, 
into Claire Danes in my so-called life. So that's me. <laughs> Tucking hair that's not there behind my ear. Nothing. And then this guy, Justin Ross, reaches out and feels my chest. Pretty solid there. Yeah. <laughs> you ever wrestle? So I said, yeah. Because like this one time I had wrestled with this boy in the back room at the bowling alley. And so he said, well, oh, well, like what weight class? And I realized he was really talking about wrestling. So I, oh, I said, oh, no, no, I, I, I didn't understand the question. So he's like, oh, you should join the team. We're going to stick around after school. And so I said, well, what does that have, you know, what does that entail? And he's like, oh, so we like hang out, we strip down, and we lift. So I joined. And wouldn't you know that I fell madly in love with Justin Ross. But suddenly I had this secret and I had to tell somebody. So, second semester of my freshman year of high school, one day in the library, I'm hanging out with my fag hag, Katie. She didn't know she was my fag hag, but she was. And I was like, oh my God, Katie, I have a secret to tell you. And she was like, oh my God, I love secrets. And I was like, um, Okay, I can't tell you. You're gonna have to like guess. It'll be like a game. And she was like, oh my God, I love games. You're gay. Snap, yeah. So she guessed it right away. And one by one, I started telling all of my friends and friends of friends and anyone that I knew that I was, that I liked boys and girls. Well, first I started with boys and girls, and then it became boys, and then it became men. <laughs> and I had told everybody, except for Pixie and Ernie. But I just couldn't find, like, the right time to actually say the words, to admit it. And it finally presented itself Christmas. Christmas, my sophomore year in college. So we'd gone out to a party, we'd had fun, had a few eggnogs. We had come home and I was like so excited because VH1 was playing a Madonna-rama where they basically played all Madonna music videos and clips for a full 24 hours. So they're playing Madonna-rama. So as soon as we get home, I like rush in and I go downstairs to watch TV, which was like right around the era of gambler, dress you up. And um, my mom goes upstairs, she comes downstairs about 15 minutes later, and she was like, uh-uh, no, turn it. Miracle on 34th Street. And I was like, mom, it's the whole reason we came home early. <laughs> she was like, uh, hello, it's Christmas. And I was like, hello, it's Madonna. And then my mom looked at me and said, <laughs> I don't know why you want to watch this. What are you, a fag or something? I know. So, I know what to say to that. I didn't think about what I was going to actually say, but the words just like fell out of my mouth. And I said, yeah, I'm a fag. I'm a big fag. And we're going to watch Madonna! And for the first time ever, my mom was completely speechless. We sat there watching like express yourself or something in silence. And my mom got up and went to bed. And the next morning, Christmas, she gets up and she comes to me and said, you know, I had a few last night, but I seem to remember that you said that you were, and I said, yeah, I am, Mom. I'm gay. And we had like a heart-to-heart, -heart and I told her I was a bottom, and it was 
seemingly great. It was slightly touch and go for a while, but I knew we were good. About five, six years later, we're in New York City, my mom has come to visit, and we've had a fabulous day. We've gone to see Broadway shows, we've gone shopping at Versace, and we've ended up downtown in the West Village at Pieces. Now, for those of you in New York City, people who are not New York City people, Pieces is, well, it's not the classiest of gay bars. So, but they did have, on Tuesdays, karaoke. So, my mom gets up, and she is doing her Mae West impersonations. She is singing Everything's Coming Up Roses in the style of Ethel Merman. And, like, the queens are living for her. Yes! Yes! So, my mom comes off the stage. She goes to the bar. Everyone's like, oh, my God, let me buy you a drink. I'm sitting there, dejected, ignored. And my mom's sitting there with like three drinks in front of her. And she turns to me and she says, in her best Mae West, oh, there's nothing like a few queens to cheer a girl up. And that's how I knew we were good. Again, my name's Adolfo Blair, and I hope you're enjoying this. Adolfo Blair, ladies and gentlemen, Adolfo Blair. Adolfo, that is some of the gayest shit I've ever seen in my entire life. Amazing. Oh gosh, so back to my top 10 reasons. I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet. Uh, number six, I used to carry around a stuffed Pomeranian. I used to pet it and say, I'm waiting until I get a real one, like Dr. Evil. Uh, yeah. Uh, number five reason I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet. My first job was at a truck stop. The gays that know, I know why you know. All right. Guys, so Adolfo Blair just danced to Vogue, and this next comedian has written for Vogue, and we're changing up the format a little bit. Um, her poor roommate came down with COVID, so... Uh, we're just changing this format up. Uh, she's done the show before, and this is a really great set. So, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Mila Miles! You do. You, you kind of, like, are coming out all the time, right? Like, about different things about yourself, um, whether it's queer shit or, like, black shit. Oh. Or sometimes I gotta come out as a woman, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> my job just switched to... Um, all gender bathrooms and single user bathrooms. And um, I mean, I do identify as a non-binary woman, but they don't need to know all of that because those single user bathrooms are luxurious as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> they took all the executive suite bathrooms and gave them to us. <laughs> That's reparations, bitch. Okay? I like this corporate shit now. No, no, gay and black, what? Oh my God, they don't know what to do with me. It won't leave me alone at the same time. Um, but no, I, just, I work, like, I do be coming out a lot. But it's just fun now, it's like a fun game. Like, I've learned to finesse it in all these years of my life, you know what I mean? Like, first time I, like, really came out, I was in eighth grade. I know, I came out in eighth grade. And it was because my living, my, my like, living dynamic changed. I moved in with my dad. He lived in the suburbs, all white. My uh, brothers and sisters were all mixed. Their mom was white. I'm fucking light-skinned as fuck. So everybody in the neighborhood thought I was half white. No offense to y'all, but you know. Uh, <laughs> like, no, I'm black. Yes. All of it. But you know, I love my biracial friends too. I love y'all. Um, but no, like, it was crazy because I've been exposed to so many different things culturally, right? Like. Those, those white kids be getting down in the, in the suburbs. Oh my God. Like, I thought my cousins were bad for just smoking weed. Like, God damn. I watched one of my friends legit get arrested in school for selling weed. A little blonde white girl with green eyes. She was so skinny and frail. She didn't give a fuck. She was nutting up. I felt like Crime Mom, Not Give You Buck had just come out too, and I felt that in my head. And P3 players weren't out yet. Don't, don't try to guess my age, but they weren't out yet. Um, but no, it was crazy, and the kids were sexually active, which I wasn't. Like, you know, I made out with boys in the summers. You know, we played high and go get it. <laughs> <laughs> we 
told our parents we were playing hide and go seek, of course. Um, but you know, like, you know, I made out with boys that I was dating for the summer, holding hands, riding bikes, shit like that. You know, I'm from the, from the Midwest. But when I moved to the suburbs, out of the hood, like, those kids were smoking weed, they was having threesomes. My dad left, left for work one day in the winter, snow everywhere, quiet. You know, kids can get away with a lot of shit in the winter, for real. That's why I love living up north. Hell yeah. Your parents don't find you no babysitter. Ain't nobody coming out there in the snow, you know? So like, um, one time, some of the kids, these two girls, this black girl and this white girl, they was friends. And I think they was hitting on me all the time, but like, I didn't realize how gay I looked. And now that I'm wearing this hat, and I'm probably a little coordinated tonight, I dressed just like this in middle school. <laughs> Except like, my shirt was tucked all the way in, and the sleeves were rolled up, and I wore hoop earrings, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, okay girl, and my hat was backwards in a ponytail, bitch, like, you're gay. <laughs> uh, but like, um, no, like, they brought a boy over, and they wanted to like, fuck in my house, because they knew my dad was never home. And I was like, no, but I was mad at my dad. So I let them fuck on his Lexus in the garage. <laughs> his brand new Lexus, fuck him. Fuck you, dad. He didn't let me go to the spring fling because I got in trouble. <laughs> fuck him. My science teacher said I was talking in class, but I was asking real questions, okay, bitch? Like, this was around the same time they were saying that like, what was it, Pluto or something? It was like Planet X, so I was like challenging my teacher and he was pissed. I was cracking mad jokes too, he hated that shit. <laughs> he was a bald and bleached blonde guy with blue eyes, a small face with like a long head and like a tiny earring. He hated me. I used to crack surfer jokes on that motherfucker. <laughs> My teachers knew I, gay. I was gay. I think they knew I was gay. But like, um, when I came out in eighth grade though, I was in the school, I was still in my old school for a little bit, then I left after that, after that spring fling thing, and I went to this white school, and everybody was wildin' and everything, and the white girl who lived, who came over to have the threesome, she lived three houses down from me. And um, she, she was having a birthday party, I think it was her 14th or 13th birthday party, and all the girls were coming, and all of these white girls used to be talking about how they used to practice making out with each other for their boyfriends, and I was like, oh. <laughs> I was like, I don't want no parts in that. I'm sitting here and I'm gonna watch TRL all day. I'm good, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, like she had a birthday party and I was like, okay, this will be fun. Like I'm making more friends, you know? So I go to her birthday party and it's all girls there. And her brothers are like upstairs coming up and down. And they're like, you know, I guess her dad said the boys couldn't come anymore or something. But then she kept telling us the boys were coming. And I was just like, where are the boys at? Like, because then they pulled out a bottle and they were talking about playing spin the bottle. And I was like, where are the boys at? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not doing this. And then they started playing spin the bottle. And I had been like playing with this balloon, like acting like I wasn't a part of it and like inching away from the circle. And I was really trying to get away. I was like, okay, I don't know, you know? And Next thing you know, I heard him spin it once, and I was like, oh, this is wild. Because I was like, oh, I can watch girls kiss, you know? And I'd be in the back. And then... What a creep. <laughs> that was creepy, I guess. Um, <laughs> so I was like playing with the balloon in the corner. <laughs> but then the bottle landed on me. It was like the second or third turn. And that shit was crazy. I felt like I got the wind knocked out of me when that shit happened. Um, because, like... I was just like, fuck, like, oh, I, like, I don't know what to do, you know, I was like, because when I thought the boys were coming, I'm like, we're going to play spin the bottle, like, I got this, like, I've been kissing boys for three summers now, you know what I mean, like, I know what I'm doing, but like, when there were no boys, I was like, oh, shit, I don't want to practice, and what's crazy is, at the time, I guess, like, the, so the girl who I had to kiss, she looked like a, like a, like a baby punk, like Evanescence inspired, you know? And I was a big Evanescence fan at the time, you know? And I'm like, listen to Sum 41, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I was like, I can kiss her. Um, and we kissed, and what's crazy is like, I don't remember the kiss that much, I don't remember like what it physically felt like, but there was something so sweetly inevitable about it, you know what I mean? And it like, it, it just like hit me, and I was just like, damn, like, Okay, like, and I, didn't, I really didn't know what to feel about it. So then like, I like stopped kissing her, they went back about the game, and I, then I continued to creep in the corner with my balloon. And I like, inched in the corner, and then I made up an excuse like a few minutes later about having to go home, like, 
my dad was texting me or something like that. And I, went, I ran, I sprinted. It was like spring, I sprinted to my house. And when I ran to my house, um, I ran into my room and I threw myself on my bed and I just bawled. I bawled, I bawled, right? I, I didn't even know what was happening. I was like, why am I crying? I fucking bawled. And I remember it so much because like, I, I bawled for so long. My dad eventually came home from work and he found me still crying. He was like, imagine this like 30 something year old dude and he has a teenage daughter. He's literally like, I don't know why this bitch is crying. <laughs> like, he just contemplated giving me a Vicodin when I was having period cramps. You know, he was like, I don't know what's wrong. Like, do you? I was like, that's too big. I don't know if I need all that. You know, like, this nigga didn't know what to do, you know? So like, he was just like, I, I remember I could feel him, he was like so scared. So I like, you know, catering to fragile masculinity or whatever, I like softened it up a little bit and I was like, okay, I gotta stop crying now because this nigga don't know what to do. <laughs> like, fuck out of here. And I'm trying to get him to like, give me my internet privileges back. <laughs> this nigga took the mouse out the house, right? <laughs> mouse back, so I ain't even gonna <laughs> make this hard on. <laughs> so, my bad, y'all. But like, <laughs> I hated that nigga, I swear to God. I was so proud of that car. He had a dentist car too, and he thought it was because of the garage. Like, <laughs> they, was, they was having a full-blown teenage threesome. It was great. I, there was no windows in the garage too. I was tight because I wanted to see. Oh, um, but no, um, yeah, I was, I was crying and what he did was, I, then I just made up an excuse. I didn't tell him what happened. I didn't tell him why. I told him kind of what was also the problem. And I was just like, I'm, I need to go back to my old school. <laughs> like, I can't do this shit. This white shit gonna have me fucked up in the game. It's gonna have me fucked up. I still gotta get my scholarship. I can't be out here wilding. Girls wanna have me drunk crazy. Trust me, my first, my GPA, my freshman year in college was a 2.4, bitch. Like, I was wild. I was in an all-girls dorm at a black university. What did you expect? Right? H-U? You know what I mean? I went to Howard University. You know what I mean? All girls, freshman year. They think it's a punishment. Not to the gay girls. <laughs> that shit is nice. I had a cafeteria in my, in my fucking shit, too. I did not go to class all winter. I was flunked out of biology. I had to change my major after that. I did. They're not gonna let me graduate on time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, y'all, like I was Florida. He sent me back to my old school where like I was just one of many quirky black girls. You know what I mean? So like people wanted to study me. There was like really gay basketball players for them to pay attention to, you know, like I was like a swimmer and a dork. Like I hung out with the guys who traded Pokemon cards and they would always try to teach me, but I like didn't give a shit. But like I let them ask me out to the dance. So they were like my dates to the dance. Like I hung out, I dated the nerds, you know what I mean? Like I was just coasted, nobody wasn't bothered. Um, and then when I really came, so then I came out to my parents because, so that's when I came out to myself, right? And then that same year, y'all, this is what did it. This was the year that tattoo came out on MTV. All the things you said, all the things, you know what I'm talking about? Those two gay, those two fake gay Russian bitches. You know what I mean? It's like I have a complicated relationship with that shit because it helped me come out, but they lied, right? But we're finding out everything from our childhood is a lie now, so fuck it. Um, but yeah, I came out because that, so that song was out at the time, and I was like turned into a little mini feminist at the time, like for real. Like we had our science project when I was still at the white school. We had our science fair. My dad's dumb though. I don't think this is this doesn't prove that I'm gay. It just proves that I, you know, think women are better than men most of the time. You know I mean? But uh, I did this science experiment with all my classmates. I had most of them participate, and I showed the brain pattern differences and how women and men function and multitask. I was like, oh. like that's some fucked up shit though. Don't do that shit today, that's, some, that's problematic. But I was like, let me show my dad how stupid he is. <laughs> I did, I did, I hated him. Um, 
He never kept money in the house. I used to want to steal it. I did. I did want to steal his money. He wouldn't notice. He's an idiot. Like, come on. Twenty, thirty dollars here and there. Fuck you. You should steal from your parents. So you learn how to invest better. You know, don't waste that shit. Um, but no, like I came out to my dad um, because I don't know. Like, I was watching it one day, and then um, I had this gay friend, and her girlfriend tried to kiss me. Um, when I hung out with her, and I was like, I don't want any any of this drama or whatever. But then I was talking to my dad one day, and then I just burst into tears again. <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. I burst into tears, and I just told him I was just like, I, I think I like girls too. You know, I was like, I'm I'm not bisexual now. I mean, dudes can be cute or whatever, but like, I'm a lesbian now. <laughs> like, but then I was like, let me ease into it, you know. And I told him I was bi, and um, he was just like. Okay, he was like, you know, I kind of knew because of your science projects. And I was like, no, that's not what I'm not gay. Okay. Idiot. Stupid idiot. He's an idiot, bro. I swear to God, I'm not making this guy up. I was. Um, but um, yeah, and then I got on the phone and I called my mom and I told her and she was chill about it and silent. That was in eighth grade, you know? So then they took it easy and, or whatever, and then I never acted on it. I told my sister and my cousin, no one ever questioned me about it, because they probably like, we were just having a moment, I guess. And I only had a moment of testing the water, because then, like, middle school happened, high school happened. When I was in high school, I was so focused on just getting out where I was from that, like, I wasn't, like, thinking about that kind of stuff. Damn, shit, is that the right? Fuck. Okay, so, oh, nice. Um, well, anyways, like, I was, uh, what was I saying? Um, yeah, like the thing, I, I got it. So I got it. So this song came out the second time. Um, I, my boyfriend, of two years in high, in middle, in, in high school, broke up with me because I had signed a full ride scholarship to Howard for track, yes. and he was like, he thought he was gonna hold me back, which he would have. But I was sad at the time, so I was like, no, you're not gonna hold me back. And he, I had told him that I came out as bi when I was eighth grade, and he kind of always knew. So he just like let me go, and I was like, bro, what the fuck? And then after that, I saw this one girl who used to be on the track team with me one day. And I went and hung out with her. I was like, she was like, oh, you want to kick it? I was like, sure, girl. And we were hanging out in her mom's house, and she was just like, you know, I always fucked with you because you were the one of the few girls on the team who never treated me weird. And I was like, yeah, you're just a person. But I was like, honestly, my freshman year, I did have a crush on you when I saw you on the basketball court. And then she was just like, oh, word? And I was like, word. This is literally how it happened. This is who I love, nigga, this is who I love. I was like, word. And she came and sat by me, and then like, you know, we chilled for a little bit, smoked a little weed, and I did not smoke weed, and I was like, let me just smoke this weed in front of this girl. And I smoked some weed with her, and then we, uh, we fucked. We fucked for a little bit. You know, right? Like, straight into it. We did, and it was great, and I went home the next day, and for the remainder of my second semester, my last semester, in my senior year, I just stole my mom's car every fucking night <laughs> to go have a tryst in her car with this fucking girl, Trist, right? Like, we're fucking, right? An affair. Uh, rendezvous, I don't fucking know. We were fucking a lot in her car. And then when the girl, like, started seeing somebody else, I just got on down link and started meeting more girls to fuck in my mom's car until I left for college. And uh, when I got to Howard, it was great. Like, I had a lot of practice, you know? Um, I did not know what I wanted, but I thought I did. I was still telling people I was bi. And then, um, I don't know, like, I, you know, for my first year, like, I had to stay in an all-girls dorm, and that, that about did it. Like, <laughs> there was so many horny freshmen in there who wanted to figure their shit out. So, you know, I was happy to be a good friend to a lot of people. <laughs> Mila Miles, ladies and gentlemen, was that hilarious? So freaking funny, amazing. Uh, how are you guys doing? I still have four reasons yet to tell you why I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet. So number four reason I should have known is that I won the Home Economics Award in eighth grade for making silver lame pants. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> award-winning silver lame pants. That's right. Uh, and the number three reason I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet is that ironically, my last girlfriend's name was Summer Wrong. And here's the proof that she's real. All right, are you guys ready for your next comedian? Silence. Okay, uh, <laughs> she's phenomenal. I met her on a great show 
uh, called Happy Place Comedy that is in uh, QED in Astoria uh, with Sue Funk and the amazing Katie Kampa. So guys, also QED, if you want to help support that amazing venue too, and Cambry Cruz, who's the owner, uh, you can do so right here. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, this next gal is hilarious. And she's live from her parents' house. Put your hands together for Lindsay Bowling! Uh, my name is Lindsay. I've never told my coming out story in this way before. I've always told it through stand-up and I guess processed it through jokes. So it's been interesting to self-reflect on it, especially being where I am. I'm at my parents' house. I came here for the foreseeable future because of Corona. I, this is where it all started. The gayness. I do look for gay evidence in my life. I do. I feel like when I was younger, I probably showed some signs. I wore a lot of track suits, for example. Was that a 90s thing? Was it a gay thing? Don't know. I auditioned for the musical Annie when I was in fifth grade really wanted to be Annie, did not get it. The director said I sang the song Tomorrow sarcastically. So I got the part of Pepper, who was the mean orphan, the bully, uh, the lesbian, basically. <laughs> All the other orphans were like dancing around, doing gymnastics. My character was sitting in the back, smoking a cigarette, yelling things like, your parents are dead. Which, that was not a line in the play. I improvised that in the play. I um, was really good at sports. I think around that middle school time is when you start to, that's when like boy girl parties start to happen. And that's why I think a lot of lesbians are good at sports because after practice, kids are like, hey, you wanna to go to this boy girl party? You're like, no, I'm gonna keep practicing. I'm gonna stay out in this field until the sun goes down. <laughs> I also, um, in second grade, stole batteries from Home Depot in my fanny pack. So I think that's enough evidence right there. High school, just mostly into soccer. That was my girlfriend at the time. College was where I first met real live lesbians. And I was like, let's go, let's go. These are my people. I feel comfortable in this environment. Cargo shorts, polos, get on me. Um, I didn't wear those things, but I gravitated towards them uh, pretty quickly freshman year. <laughs> I had two friends, so this was the, one of the first people I ever came out to. Uh, I think it was my sophomore year of college, but I thought they were dating. But I wasn't sure and I didn't want to ask because I was scared. I, on one of their computers in their dorm room, um, they had The Sims game playing. I looked at their sim and I saw that it was in love with the girl who I thought she was dating, Sim. And I like, they kissed and the, they were like, had love hearts above their heads. And I was like, oh my God, they're dating. And that's how I knew. Still didn't say anything to them, still scared. But like, my heart was happy. So then we're talking later that year on Instant Messenger. And they were talking about a guy that liked me. And I was like, I don't think I'm into him. And then I was like, I don't, think I'm into any guys and they were like what do you mean and I was like I think I like girls and that was the first time I had ever expressed that and I only did it because I you know had knew that they were the same so I felt comfortable telling them and um, of course they were very nice about it and then I kind of kept it still hidden that I was probably 20 at the time and then uh, came out to my littlest sister, was the first in-person person that I came out to. I, I think I told her we were at a bar and I was like, she knew that I had dated girls before and I was like, I think I just need to date girls. And she was like, you should. 
I still like tried really hard to not be gay. <laughs> Like I thought, maybe I just haven't found the right guy or something, um, which wasn't, that wasn't it. And my parents are also like super supportive. Um, they weren't, they weren't scary people to come out to at all. They have, I came out to them when I was 25. This was about six years ago. And they had both asked me multiple times, like the past five years before that if I was gay. Once my mom took me out to dinner and was like, man, I wish if I knew anyone who was gay, they would just tell me. And I was like, I don't see anyone here. <laughs> so it took a while. I'm sure I was wearing like a backwards hat at the time too. Um, I came out to them on the phone. I called my mom one night in New York. They were in here in Kentucky and I called her and you know, just was like, I'm, I think I want to date girls and was crying and she couldn't have been nicer and, you know, told me that she loved me just the way I was. And then I let that conversation went on and ended. And then I was like, can you tell dad? <laughs> Cause I didn't want to do it. And, um, so she did, even though again, my dad's super supportive. So I got a call from him a few days later and I think I was at a 4th of July party at the Creek in the Cave, shout out. Um, and uh, doing comedy or something. And he, you know, couldn't have been nicer on the phone. And, and um, yeah, so that was, I think my coming out story involves a lot of um, technology. The only people I came out to face to face was my sister and um, all the girls that I, um, hooked up with in college. <laughs> um, it's been funny after though, like the, the, I think the, the hard part for me was not the coming out part. It's like the lesbian dating scene, first of all, in New York is a shit show. Um, but then also like, like recently I had a breakup last year and my little sister was like trying to help me through it. The one I came out to and she was like, here, listen to these songs I listened to them when I broke up with my boyfriend but for you when it says boy in the song just change it to girl I was like yeah I got it um thank you Meredith <laughs> for that <laughs> so our advice is is not is not move forward as much um but still supportive and I have not made them watch any gay movies um while I've been in in quarantine with them, but also in fairness, my dad is not making me watch 1917. There is one girl in that, but she's like sad, so. All right, thank you, Sean. I think my time's almost up, but um, this was fun. Give it up for Lindsay at her parents' house. Come on, come on. All right, guys, we have one more comedian left and I have two more reasons to tell you why I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet. So let's just do it. Number two reason I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet is that I lied and said I had a crush on Sandra Bullock. What straight man has a crush on Sandra Bullock? Zero. Sorry, Sandra. It's just the truth. And the number one reason I should have known I was gay before I came out of the closet is that on my 10th birthday, my twin brother and I shared a birthday cake. And he was wearing a Spider-Man shirt. On his side of the cake was a baseball player. And I was wearing a three quarter length sleeve Rehoboth Beach tee. And on my side of the cake was a unicorn laying under a rainbow. Yeah, the number one reason I should have known and the reason why my family and the entire planet Earth knew I was gay before I came out of the closet in 1997. So guys, are you ready for your final comedian? She's a delight. I just adore her. She's part of the She Devil Comedy Festival. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the amazing Chewy May! Hi, I am Chewy May, and this is my coming out story. Um, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and I grew up in a pretty, pretty Chinese, pretty Christian household. And I, I, I knew that I was always like a weird, different kid. I just, 
I just didn't know what made me weird or different. Um, so because I was pretty odd and weird, I um, always got picked on in school. Um, but growing up in the church, it was fine. It was fine that I got picked on because church taught us, like, it's okay if you have no friends. Jesus is your friend. So if he thinks you're cool, then you're cool. So I always thought I was hella cool because Jesus was my best friend. So, um, that was pretty much my childhood. I, I guess I always, I'd never, I I didn't know that I was a homosexual. Um, I just knew that, like, I liked the same shows my dad liked. Like, he loved Baywatch, I loved Baywatch. And he loved Telemundo shows, I loved Telemundo shows. Not knowing that I was too young and ignorant to understand the plot, I just really liked Pam Anderson and Berg Twitters. Um, so that was my childhood. Um, and then it came to a point where in junior high, when hormones start developing, when like people start showing like who they're attracted to, I was realizing I was pushing towards maybe gay. So I would, yeah. And I was like, that which shocked me a little bit. Um, it was against Christian teachings. And I remember in, so here's the thing. I, in, when I was in junior high school, I, it was like early, like 2000 to 2000. Two. So, and it was in Brooklyn, New York. Like, and I went to school in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. So, during this time, we would still be like, "That's gay, fucking gay," and then we would say, "Faggot." Um. So I, even any attraction I had towards women, even in school, I'd be like, "Quiet down," because I'm not gay. I have a, I love dudes, dudes, yay. I remember like a classmate would be like, "Do you like boys or girls?" I'm like, "I love boys." Are we kidding? Boys, boys are great. Do you want to cover my house for a sleepover? Because you're pretty and I, and you and I are pretty too. Like I, I, I knew I was gay, but I would like try my best to cover it. Um, and then it came into high school and in, in high school, um, it's funny thing with self-hatred comes like when you don't like yourself, then other people would not like you. So I also, and so when high school came no friends, so I clung on to Jesus some more, started getting super active into Jesus, I got baptized, I became a Bible study leader, I became a staff member for a youth Christian conference, and I even tried to start a Christian club at my school. Um, I would wear t-shirts that had Bible verses on it, um, even I would I I would try my best to like evangelize to my classmates. So yes, I was that annoying Christian girl at the school and even I remember even taking the subway and I would see like a woman in another seat. I, I like I feel like I would I, I felt like I would I was filled with this holy ghost and the holy ghost would be like, "Oh, you should go over there and ask her if she needs something to pray for." And I would go up to her and be like, "Hey, miss, do you need me to pray for anything for you?" Not nah. Not knowing that I was like, that it was just attracting to her, that it wasn't that, but like I would, it would happen like a couple of times on the train where I would be like, this woman needs, needs salvation. Not knowing that in my back of my mind, I was like, I, this woman is hot, but in my mind, I'm like, this woman needs salvation and I'll, and I should give it to her. But yeah, back to high school. Um. And then um, I, I remember in back in the church, junior year of high school, we had a sermon and the sermon was called The Third Gender, which was about homosexuality. And that sermon made me break, made me break down. I cried to a sister in the church and then she linked me up with the church counselor and for a year I, well, go to like church therapy sessions with her 
and try to figure this gay shit out and it and try to get Jesus back into my life and focus on Jesus and figure out the cause of these gay thoughts and I did that for a year and what made me stop was in in my secular high school my non-christian high school uh, I was also part of the tech team for our high school musical and seeing how free and how self expo and how everybody was just self ex using their self expression through their art i realized like this is what i'm lacking i'm lacking lacking this self like embracing who i was embracing anything of myself i was trying so hard to be a good christian lady woman for a future christian husband so I, I went up to an art teacher and I told her how tired I was and how it was this very tiring, just this figuring out this Christian life. And then she told me something very important, which she said that at the end of the day, you, know, you don't have any friends around you, you don't have any parents around you, you don't have family around you, it's just you and yourself. Can you look at yourself in the mirror and be proud? And that, at that moment, was a start of trying to figure out who I was and accepting the fact that I might be gay. And um, I talked about this with some of my church friends, and they said something very lovely that. They said, it's okay that you're, you might be gay because God loves, you know, killers, murderers, rapists, and also gays because, you know, they're all the same. So that made me leave the church. And when I left the church, I then told my parents. Um, then I went away first year of college. Went away and... Um, and to like this, to like this, for self discovery and to like figure out who I was, it was go could because like I was in a dorm by myself and nobody knew who I was in the school, so I could start fresh. And it was great. It was great. Like in school, I lost my virginity. I drank for the first time. I swore for the first time, and I was really on doing this self ex self-realization to a point where my GPA for my first year of college was a one point something. So I did a lot of self-realizations there. And um, so when I officially, when I finally dropped out of my first school, came home, parents knew about it, parents knew I was gay. Went to, then when I finally accepted and Finally accepted this this ambiguity of who I was. I started dating, started checking out like comedy and doing all the things. And um, it came to a point where like years later, I was probably like early 20s, like 23 or 24. And uh, some forgot some chick broke up with me and then I was in the kitchen crying and then my mom came home to me and then when I told her that was all because of a, a lady she looked at me in the eye and said hey did you get tested and I was like no no I didn't get tested and she like then she said to me because you should because she sounds like a whore and that was the meanest thing my mother has ever said to me, but that was also the most accepting thing that my mother has ever said to me. And since then, I started really, I really started to accept myself. And yeah, and it was, became this, the best moment of my coming out story was this, the fact that everything I went through with school, the church, the depression and anxiety all led to my mom calling 
a woman that hurt, broke my heart, that a woman that hurt me a whore, and that just made it all worth it. It seems like, yeah, it's great. Oh, Chewy, so great. Uh, amazing. Guys, thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for supporting not live comedy. <laughs> um, but I also want to thank again Nick Green from the Social Distancing Festival for having us be a part of this. And again, support our friends at Stonewall, uh, Ms. Kimley, Charles, and Lawrence who aren't working tonight. Again, here are their Venmos. And guys, thank you so much and I hope you all stay home and stay safe during this time. And I hope to see you guys in the real world real soon. All right, bye.